this party at night after the show and was a couple. And he, he was American and she was French. That they became very good friends of mine. And they said, can we have lunch tomorrow, Jose? They saw the show. So we went to lunch. I went to lunch with them. I said, I don't know what they want. They said, do you want to form your own company? I said, I don't think I'm ready to do my own company. I was 23 years old, 24. <laughs> you know. I said, thank you. I'm not ready now. But when I'm ready, I will let you know. So I have a conflict with Jose Greco. And to make it a long story short, I left the Jose Greco company. And I called these people who were in Washington, D.C. and said, yes, I'm ready for the company now. I wasn't. <laughs> and you know, you had to leave. OK? So anyway, I did my first company that you will see again, OK? When we put the clip, OK? And um, that's what I did my company. I can, you know, los chavales de España used to be an orchestra and singers and dancers. They used to have a couple of dancers. They asked me to be, if I want to be with them. Then I worked with the Jose Greco company. I told Mr. Norman Baker, who was the agent, the manager for Jose Greco, that the chavales de España called me if I can dance with them. And they said to and Mr. Lorenbach said to me, if you dance with them, you will never dance with us anymore. I understood that, because they don't want to have a company who is overexposed with dancers. You know what I mean? They want a company that is different, not to see the same face every day. That is a thing that today, before we used to have more work. Today, we have very little work, and that's why we want to see the same person again, and the same person again. And sometimes you get tired, you know. Sometimes I want to go to see the show, but I saw you three times already. So don't blame me if I don't go. <laughs> but I love them, you know. So what am I now? So I did, I did my company. And these people from Washington, D.C. were business people. And they, I think that the purpose of them it is that they own too much money, and they will have a small company, my company, and take that money to give it to me, that they can raise that out of the income tax. <laughs> Something like that, it, it, it has to be. Anyway, I think that, I thank them very much. They saved my life, okay? And from there, and I went on, I went on. Then suddenly, they dropped me down with no advice. Just a letter, I was in Spain rehearsing, and they sent me a letter that they quit, I don't have any more a company. But again, I was blessed. Somebody came to my salvation. Arthur Chaffman, who has been my manager for many, many, many years, you know. So he said, don't worry, you, I, want you, I want to be your manager. I said, thank you, I'm from there. I went on and on. I mean, I didn't throw myself in a glass of water. I left myself up, I continued until have my big company until 15, 20 years ago. Then I have a smaller company. And then I teach. In between, as you know, most of those, these people have learned, they've been, they've been in, in my class. Most of them. <laughs> anyway, and it was a pleasure for me to teach. I love to teach. I love to give my heart in my teaching. I'm a very honest person, and I love to teach. Now, if somebody can ask me anything, why I like to teach? Because you have to dance. Because you have to live. You have to get out of your house. And it's good for you for exercise. 
So this is my life, I like that. And you can ask him, you can ask me anything. But yes, I said yes. God did protest me very much. I was very pleased. It's beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. So, so, so you've all brought up two really interesting issues, and I'm curious about one. And I'm, I'm trying to. We're trying to understand this uh, in our hope to discover the terrain of New York. This back and forth between the concert stage, where you usually leave, you lose your shirt, it's very difficult to break even at BAM or at the Joyce, or it's hard to pay f dance usually loses, even if you sell a receipt in the house, not always, but sometimes. And, and, and the cafe stage, which is an historic, you know, uh, back and forth. Could, could you speak to that? The, the going back and forth as a performer and as a choreographer, company director between the Cafe Cantante, which has had many incarnations in New York City, and the concert stage. Well, you know, we had agents all over the city. And my first one, Mr. Marcos, would get us jobs on the wrong side of the Catskills. There was the rich side and there was the poor side. Well, I got the poor side first, and Geraintkin was with me on those wonderful little gigs. And they maybe paid you $50. We split it, and they got 10% commission, so you took them $5 on Monday morning. That was their commission. But they had, there were those people who were working who would give you the opportunity to go how to get on and off the stage. Today, the young dancer doesn't have that opportunity. They know their dances, but they don't always necessarily know how to project what they're doing. And my always thing is, don't perform, dance. I did, do not like bra ra ra hip ba 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 ba. I want the heart to speak. And if you dance, every time you do that same dance, you will have a different experience. And like I said. They paid to, one of my students said, well, when do I look at the audience? And I said, they pay to, they pay to see you. You do not pay to see them. <laughs> and, and so we were able to, and before funding, we did our debut concert at the 92nd Street Y, and they gave you a break. They, they, you paid $100, I think. And they, they had the tickets, they did their publicity, et cetera. And, you were, and then you split 70, 30, or something. But we weren't getting funded. And I did programs all over the city and concerts and things. All right, dancers weren't making 150 and $200 a performance. But they were able to get through life on the little bit here and a little bit there. And then what happened was when we all formed non-for-profit corporations, and then you had l lawyers, and then you had accountants, and you had l a lot of administrative things to do, and a lot of young dancers, especially in the modern dance world, they, didn't, they stopped dancing because if they were going to choreograph, they didn't have the energy to fundraise and to, and to choreograph and keep their bodies in shape to be able to perform. And so now everything is, the whole world is explosive with money. And so of course, they don't have the little areas to make some money. And so you, 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 you don't start from the bottom, you gotta start from the middle. So the the bar scene was a steady income. You yeah. could pay your bills. Yeah, you went to Staten Island and danced in an old airplane hangar that turned into a nightclub. You worked with a stripper. You worked with a, a dance, another dance team. Uh, 
We worked with the cellophane girl up in Providence. She came from Philly and she came out with, she was the rain girl. But we made our money and we were able to survive from one month. To, but don't forget, may I confess, I lived in a six story walk up with no heat in the winter for $26.52 a month. So it was possible today, forget it, now that's $2,650 <laughs> to have the bathtub in the kitchen. So you worked also between the concert stage and the and you also danced in in cafes or you never did once you were with oh, Greco yeah. you did oh yeah I mean I went to nightclubs nightclubs yeah supper clubs yeah supper clubs yes uh, I did that almost for three years in Europe and like I told you when I was fifteen I went to nightclubs uh, my first job was in Belgium in the beach of Ostend, it's called. A beautiful town, a beautiful beach. When to go to take class, when I, I was nine years old, when I went to my first Spanish dance class. To go to class, my father said, you want to be a dancer? You have to work for it. So I work in a fish market every day from 8 o'clock in the morning to 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and they give me five pesetas. Five pesetas was my class. So I, I did that for, for five years. Then when I went you know, from five pesetas, then I went to the company, what I told you before, Soledad Miralles, was 175 pesetas a day. Then I went to Europe for the nightclubs, and my first pay was 1,500 Belgian francs. That, if you exchange that to Spanish money, to the peseta, in those days, is 1,350 pesetas a day. So I went from five pesetas <laughs> to another pesetas, okay? I remember when, when they gave me my first 10,000 something, my mother was with me. I told the money, I said, Mama, look all this money. So I told the money, I like the movies, you know, <laughs> around my bed, and I never saw so much money in my life. You know? So I kept, thank God, we kept I like that. And then what? So I, I went to all these trips in Europe, and then I came to America, and my salary with Jose Greco was $175, but it was very good. I remember I have, I lived, I have an apartment on 54th Street and Lexington Avenue, and was $175 a month. Now it had to be 3,000, I don't know how much, you know. So from there, I'm losing myself. What am I talking about? <laughs> money. <laughs> money? No, no. Oh, money, money. Oh, that's the question. Okay. So, Be, yeah. just talking about money to make a request. I never have a grant from anybody. When I was dancing with my company, those people from Washington put the money. They never lost money with me. Then I went with Arthur Chapman. We never lost money. But I never went with, nobody gave me five cents, okay? And now, to make a long story short, after all those years, not, not everything was roses, okay? I went with, with my bad times. Thirty years ago, I had a surgery, and they took six inches out of my intestine. I cannot dance for six months. After the Washington people left me alone <laughs> without them, I had $1,000 in the bank. I was on social security. They gave me $40 a week. And with that $40 a week, you have to survive. But I had my $2 every day to take my ballet class with the casinos. 
Yeah. Remember the casinos? Sí, I remember yeah. the casinos. Okay. Then after that, again, Arthur Chapman, Chapman came to my rescue, and I start living again. After I cannot dance, the doctor said I cannot dance for a year. I dance in six months. I, I was ready to to go. Then my first job after that was with Luisa Triana. Luisa Triana called me from Vegas. Can you be my guest artist? I said yes, and I went there with her. Then, to make a long story short, thank God I saved my money and I invested. <laughs> so if tomorrow I have to teach, I'm well off. Thank God. I'm a working club, I have to say, I saw Tina R Ramirez with a trio at the Latin Quarter. Mm. A fancy club. <laughs> Let me tell you that. It's one thing that always said, you know, baile clásico español, baile flamenco y, y, y regional. Also, in Spain we have a word for classical o escuela bolera. Yes, es that's a baile Spanish, de yes. media punta. That means, baile de media punta, it is that you, you dance with your toes. So we used to call the escuela, oh, tú eres un bailarín de media punta. <laughs> And nobody has that word anymore. No, yes, I, I remember yeah. the word, media remember? punta. Oh, yeah. Claro, yeah. yo estudié con Perisset, mm -hmm. so Perisset, pum, pum, ru, 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 ru. Oh, el ole de la curra. Ah, el ole de la curra, sí. Y me recuerdo ahora también. Y me recuerdo de la coreografía todavía. ¿O oh, sí? Sí. <laughs> okay. Well, I, ca I can't understand because you're... Uh, what time are we talking of? We are not talking of the 50s, the 40s, the 70s, or the 80s. Well, I, the, okay. We're talking of many times, but I, 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 it was really the early career. Before you started Belling Hispanico, you were performing in clubs. Oh, I, I was performing... I told you I had a very career. Mm -hmm. So I, when I went to Spain, what do you think I did in Spain? I danced. Mm -hmm. I danced with El Principe Gitano, the, prin the gypsy prince. Mm -hmm. I danced with Carmen de Veracruz. I mean, hey, this is what I do. <laughs> you know, so I did that. And then I, I, my mother said, you have to come home because of my American citizenship. So I came home. And then everybody had forgotten me, and I started at El Chico. So, you know, that's in the early 40s. For, uh, no. No, that was already 40. I, I can't remember years anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then what, what, where were you dancing in the 50s and 60s? I, well, I can't remember the years exactly. But I know that I went to Spoleto, El Festivale de Due Mundo, the first year, 1953. I went with John Butler's company. He had seen us in, in copper and brass, and he wanted us to go to Spoleto. So my sister did not know Europe, so I wanted her to go and, and see Spain. So we were in, we left in March, April, May, and then Spoleto was in June. And we did Spoleto, and then we went to Naples, we traveled around, and we landed in Spain. And then what did you do with your sister? Oh, well, then, then, then that's when my sister went and did um, Hello, Dolly. And I stayed in New York and taught at Lola Bravo. That was the 60s. And were you also studying with the Cancino? They were Carnegie Hall? He was teaching at Carnegie Hall? Uh, or he was teaching only in Spain? No, no. The Cancino was teaching in New York. He taught at um, a place that's been torn down. He taught on 40, 49th Street. I can't remember the name of it now. Mm -hmm. But He never taught at Carnegie Hall. I don't know about that because oh, just, there's no, many never. people, many yeah. people taught in, in uh, Carnegie Hall. Mm -hmm. uh, I studied with the Nullover there. Mm -hmm. So, so once you started Ballet Hispanico, you had stopped dancing by then? Um, um, yes and no. Because my company was very young, they needed a figurehead. You know, they needed somebody. So I would come in and do one number, and that's it. And, and then when they were able to hold on to the audience themselves, I just disappeared. 
And when, how many years did that take? Uh, about one year. One year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, ha I have some pictures uh, that I can show you. Okay. okay. So this is my, my last question. I think that, Vera, it's you, time for you to save me. Uh, and, and also, um, we'd like to show you their dancing. We have some wonderful footage. But you, each of you have talked about Escuela Bolera, uh, Folklorico, yes or no, Flamenco, various um, uh, incarnations of this fusion. And also, I guess you, you would speak about ballet, but that is maybe we're not speaking about ballet at all, although people are taking ballet class, I, I would imagine. Um, it's ruining Escuela Bolera. Yeah, <laughs> okay, okay, yes. That's probably what they're saying at the Ballet Nacional as, as, as well. So this formula, um, I don't know if you know this, but um, in 1934, the government of Spain went to Antonio Marcela Argentina and Vicente Escudero and asked if they would develop a national curriculum and she said yes, and she wrote it, and I, I got it actually from her niece. Uh, she died before, um, well, as Spain. It's the Spanish War, just at the beginning of the Yes, Spanish exactly. War. Um, and, and that was the end of it. Nobody could work on it after that. Although, after the war, it becomes in the 80s uh, the Ballet Nacional de España. So to some extent, this, this mission, uh, or it was really a, it was really a, a neo-national modernist vision of building uh, a curriculum, a hybrid curriculum that somehow reunited in some egalitarian, progressive, you know, in a utopian socialist mindset the various cultures of Spain represented in dance. Um, it was to be in the service of the national, but it is very much now a piece of the, of the Ballet Nacional. Um, and it's very interesting that we continue to have this conversation. I wonder if you could talk about that a little yes, bit. Yes, but you know, but, but, Petit Pa, you know, he, when he was traveling along Europe, and he decided to go to Russia because they wanted an academy, but he, he wanted to stay in Spain. Well, he, didn't he fall in love with a very beautiful woman and get uh, thrown in oh, jail? Oh, I don't know. I, I don't know about that. I don't know about beautiful wife, women and he, being thrown in jail. I think he fell in, I think he had an affair with the police prefect's wife and they said, that's it, you're dead. And Tsar Nicholas had to bail him out. Otherwise he was gonna lose his favorite Ballet master, but something like that. But, but, but. Um, okay. So, do you want to say something about technique, about the kind of, of dance that you're developing? I mean, there's a difference between teaching, teaching, and choreography, and what goes on stage. What, what, what are the dances that are going on stage? How and how much flamenco? I mean, you can't take a measuring cup. But are we talking about flamenco? Are we talking about escuela bolera? What is the relationship between these forms when you begin and, and what happens at the end? I have div divided Escuela Bolera. That's the dance of media puntas. And then the other form I call Escuela Andaluza, which when they are already wearing shoes with little heels and heel work, start becoming a part. Like Ole de la Cura, Panaderos de la Flamenca, Panaderos de la Tertulia, up and down the line. Those I call Escuela Andaluza. Now, those are the forms where you learn to dance. You had to learn your vocabulary through those dances and to do your cast and dance along with your heel work. So by the time, if you were lucky enough to graduate into the next realm, which it would be to dance to El Benet in the Falla in Granados, uh, Torina, etc. Because that takes a lot of years of work. And people will say something about virtuosity. For me, every good dancer must have virtuosity available to them, so if their heart speaks and they need a certain kind of technique to express that, that technique should be in there. Now, when people just then go, tiki, 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 and everybody starts to applaud, that kind of virtuosity is tacky. 
It brings applause. Everybody loves it because everybody loves noise. The more noise we have today, the more they love it, you know? But, um, and to be a class, ballet vale classical, you have to be a damn good total dancer for to dance to be the fire or Albany. You have to have wonderful castanets. You must have an understanding of flamenco rhythms. You must have the ability to turn and do advanced technique. Where with flamenco, I know people, Teddy Maya, for instance, she made a lifetime doing two dances in a tablao. It become like a nine to five job, you know? You have your tianzas for tambra and your boleria, and you can go to the tablao every night and do those two dances, and it pays for your living. They send their kids to school, etc. cetera. Uh, different world. If you want to do the other stuff, it takes a lot of time, and you must learn a little bit about music. Because again, if you're going to interpret, because again, when you think, we're going to show a tape of Jiraine and I doing Triana of Albanit, you have to have the room to play the castanets and to have the virtuosity in your hands to be able to express that music. And to do Escuela I developed my own bar, which would be to build the technique of Escuela Bolera, not to build the technique for a ballet dancer. I've had a number of arguments. I said, in Escuela Bolera, you never point your food, foot and extend it out. Everything is pulled under you because everything, don't forget, 99% of your dance all developed in Andalusia, basically Sevilla. Madrid came in later. Can I, can I interrupt? Yeah. I'd like to interrupt um, because um, I want to say, well, first of all, I want to say before I forget to say this, that all of these three people here have interviews on uh, in the collection of the oral history uh, collection at the New York Public Library. So if you guys want to hear more of their stories, you can go and um, listen. Um, but Mariano, I wanted to just ask you, and I think this may be for all of you, if, you, if you'll um, let me jump in here for a second, because I think it's interesting that you mentioned the Escuela Andaluza and the Ole de la Curra and the Panaderos de la Flamenca, those kinds of dances, which you probably learned from Pericet. Yes. And those, and Pericet is, a, is, they are maestros of the Escuela Bolera. Go, Tina, go. I know, I know, I study with Pericet, so... So that's what I was wondering. It seems like, because I remember hearing, and I haven't ever talked to you, Tina, but I, I've heard from you, Mariano, about how you had some training here in the United States, and then you got over to Spain and you studied with Luisa Pericet, and she was very impressed with your technique. And I'm wondering how that goes. Listen, into you know something? Lola Bravo used to teach very well. She didn't know the names of the steps, but I knew the steps when I got to Pericet, and she used to do it, I go, oh, that's what it's called. But I, I knew all the steps because Lola Bravo had studied in the same place that I had studied with the casinos, not Pericet, because they brought the studio. In yeah. Madrid? In Madrid, in Madrid, yes. Because the, 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 the Pericets came from Sevilla. Right. Yeah. And they enjoy. Yeah. Juan Martínez taught me my first is Panaderos de la Flamenca. Uh -huh. Now, he was that type of, again, don't forget, he was dancing in 1906 or something or other. So the casinos had their vocabulary, their, vocabulary, their dances. Their Panaderos de la Flamenca was a bit different than the Perisés. Juan Martínez's was even different than most because and the one he gave me, I had to do entrechats and, and things because, again, Juan was from an older school mm -hmm. and incorporated a different approach to the choreography. So that's where I got my first Panaderos. But again, the Cancidos had all their dances. The Perisés had their dances. 
And of course, I think what happened was the petty says became more organized, and Tina and I were in with what he say at, the, at one year at the same time she was there an hour before me. But Louisa would sit there, Vuelta normal. Vuelta con destaque. We had to learn 54 steps. You had to do each one four times before you went on to the next one. And those 54 steps could not take any more than maybe 20 minutes. And you had to be alive when it was over. <laughs> <laughs> so how does that interact with, what's the relationship between this movement vocabulary and what becomes now the neoclassico, you know, the, the pieces that are sophisticated, you know, Triana and, all of these sophisticated neoclassical pieces that have that you're doing on concert stages. Who makes who choreographs those, and how do they come? What how do well, they fit in with this? For me, when I was in my teacher was Pilar Monterde in, in Madrid. When I entered that school, they were all girls. I only was the only boy. They only they call me the only man in earth. <laughs> no. Anyway, so there we learn, you know, the steps are like Tina and Mariano said. Uh, el, what, what you call el curriculari? Vocabulary. El curriculo. Curri el curriculum. And, uh, but it was very small. They really teach you the dance. Now, what you do in the dance is that curriculum. But you put that in dance. But after that, when you do a turn and you don't go a turn, we used to do turn not with the leg straight, yet with the leg a little bent. You know, I say, oh, vuelta normal. You do that in the dance, but you don't know that you are doing vuelta normal. You, you just learn the dance. But if you take the dance apart, you are doing all those steps that your teacher told you before. Then you put them together, and you make choreography. And then beside that, you go to see other people dance. You go to see that one. Everybody has a way. And you have to look which one you want, or what you like. And then you make your own self. And then you start doing this step today is that, tomorrow is the other one. And you see, like with Luisa, you learn those 54 steps. Without castanets, only by accent and timing, and that would tra also training you to give you vocabulary to be a choreographer. And she said, you, you may be doing some of these steps to different music, and maybe the castanets. But anyhow, she just wanted basic steps as, as your vocabulary. And then, of course, when you have the death, like Jose says, oh my God, I've been doing Volta Bolada for all these years, and I didn't know that's what I was doing. <laughs> that's true. Anyway, uh, also... also uh, what about... I would love to... Yeah, no. Tell me what happened. Tell us what happened. Um, describe the scene when you landed in Spain and you started taking classes, how do people respond to you? How, what, what was it like for you? What was it like to what, work for me? over there? Yeah. Well, actually, I was, I was visiting a friend of mine, Paco, Paco Fernandez, in the Barrios Bajo, and I was dancing. I was just dancing. And, and then the Principe Gitano saw me, the, not the Principe Gitano, somebody from, from his relative, Lo, Los Cuatro Heredias, saw me dancing and they said, oh, would you like to, that day they didn't say anything, the day, next day they called me up at lunchtime and they said, we would like you to come and give an audition at the Albany Theater. And I go, oh, and I thought it was a put on, you know? Coming from New York, I thought it was a put on. So I called Paco and said, hey Paco, is this really true? And he said, yeah, it is. Well, why don't you go and see? And I did, and, and it was for real. 
So I, I got the job, I auditioned and I got the job and I toured all of Spain uh, with El Principe Gitano. Yeah. That was a nice company. Oh yes, it, it was a lovely company. It was really lovely. They they had. Uh, Principe Gitano, can I explain? What? Yes. He was a uncle. folkloric Principe company. Gitano, he's a gypsy, okay, he, and he used to have a show. He used to be. Uh, he was a singer, but they present the show and always in the shows they were Spanish dancers. Yes, I, I was the classical Spanish dancer. <laughs> And there was Mariquita Heredia who did the flamenco. She was my mother-in-law. Mariquita Heredia was supposed to be my mother-in-law. Oh, yeah? No kidding. Seriously, I'm serious. I'm totally serious about that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'll tell you about that another day. Yeah. <laughs> good, good. In her life story. I was, did you notice me, my face? I went. <laughs> you have another good question? But this is unusual today, a, 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 a flamenco company, a Spanish dance company, in which you have Spanish classical dances and flamenco dances in the same company. Ballet Hispanico may be one of the only companies left doing things like this. Yes, uh, well, they don't do Spanish dance. I don't know. Uh, don't I gave up choreography in 1970s, and I, I remembered it was specifically, I said, what do I do? Do I do? Do I do choreography or do I do a dance company? And I decided, hey, let's do a dance company. And that's when I did it. That was before the Joyce, before, by the way. Before the Joyce existed. Yeah. Which is a good thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, in fact, I, I did Symphony Space first because I wanted it to be in my neighborhood, and the symphony space was in my neighborhood. It was 95th, 96th Street, so I wanted, but symphony space didn't grow the way it did, and the Joyce was there, so we went to the Joyce, and I had very good help. Thank you, Verdery Roswell. Uh -huh. so you went downtown. You went downtown. Yeah. 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 So maybe we, it's time to watch you dance. Would that be okay with you? And then I think we should open this to you if you have questions at the end. Yes? Okay, thank you. Can I help you? We're going to start. We're going to start. I'm going to be the AD person. Not that great at AD. Can I help you? Meta, can I help you? I think I can do it. So I guess the first one we have queued up first is... Not me with these nails, two years in jello. Would you please welcome Mr. Jose Molina? Okay, so do you want us to uh, pause? And Jose, you want to tell us about this? That was in the Johnny Carson, and that was uh, somebody called Rivers. That's John Rivers. John Rivers. Yes. Yeah, John Rivers. <laughs> and I had to put this. When you go under Johnny Carson, you don't do the whole dance. They give you three minutes to dance, so you have to accomplish that and put it there thing together. So you just have to go shop you dance or imagining something, do something else. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, 
And Chininda Triana, Chininda Triana, and Gino Dowry. Oh my God! I know those guys. And will you tell us, Jose? I have a question. I'm sorry. Can I jump right in? You look so much like Wito. I'm just wondering what your who did you study flamenco with? How does what's the commonality there? What, 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 what? Who did you study flamenco, or were you oh. studying with Tomas de Madrid? Did he study with Tomas yeah. de Madrid? Uh, I became, well, when I was in, uh, uh, in class with Pilar Monterde, when I started dancing, we had to do flamenco, classical Spanish, and folklore. Uh, we know all the people has a guitar. So they, we used to dance soleares or farruca by piano. Ta -ta -lo -li -lo -lan -tan, you know, what -la. Then I never did... Uh, I became then... I became a flamenco dancer when I was uh, like 25 after I started my company. That, you know, to study more flamenco. And I went to Tomás de Madrid. And he was my teacher. All I know of the flamenco, I owe to him. I started with somebody else, but yes, routine, you know. So my first teacher was, yes, uh, Thomas de Madrid. I used to do folklore, so I was going to Azorín for do the Jota. And you want to do Muñeiras, you go to somebody else. And for classical Spanish, I went to uh, Jose Granero, who I adore his choreography, you know. And I do a number what we don't have here. I did Triana, that he did for me, you know. Then I, I different, then one day I was, um, I was in Paris dancing at the Puerta del Sol, nightclub restaurant, and the owner of the restaurant said, everybody had to dance by the guitar today. So I, went, I checked. Say, I never dance with the guitar, you know. But, and I told you, we used to do farruca by piano. So I said, okay, fine. So I did my farruca. I never rehearsed. And everybody said to me, you never did farruca before? I said, no. I just invented. <laughs> uh, believe me, that they did. And I did a very good job. The second time I did that, it wasn't that good. But I remember the first time I danced Farruko by myself, you know. The way, why he said that, because I, we used to have a dancer called Loretta, Loretta what? 
Loretta Garrido that was very famous and she came to Paris that day and go to the Puerta de Sol to see the show. Sometimes what the owner said, everybody had to dance flamenco. So I did it, I did it a good job, but my teacher for flamenco was Tomar de Madrid. Then. Did he also teach Huito? Did Tomás de Madrid? Oh, and I look very much. They used to confuse me with Huito. Yeah. You know, we went to be a father, I said, Huito, and they went to see me. They, oh, you are not Huito. <laughs> no. <laughs> now we don't look alike. <laughs> I look better. <laughs> I can, I can contest to that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I want to give you this. Jorraine and I at the Marymount Theater danced to Triana of, of Albenet and as the partnership, which was forever lasting. Uh, and anyhow, this is Albanese, Triana. Can you just have stand up? Just stand up, my Jew. Could you stand up, darling?
So that Mariana Parra is in the audience, who was in the other piece. Will you stand up, Mariana, and just get a round of applause? I just want to ask Mariana, wh Triana has a long lineage. How did you come to choreograph this version of Albanese's Love. I always loved the, the music. And of course, if you don't have an affinity to that music, don't touch it. And then also, I have to tell you, I listen to the music at least 50 times before I make a step. Because I don't like making steps. I like doing choreography. And putting steps together doesn't necessarily mean that you're making choreography. You're composing a dance. But it, I like to work in like the phrases of the music to the phrases of, of movement. Well, I guess through all my, La Mary was, again, an older person by the time I got to her. And she taught the kind of Spanish that she learned. And in, in the Italian those days, it was Alegrias, Farruca, maybe a little Boleria, a lot of it done with piano. And so she said, I'm through with you, my dear. I, there's not much I left I can do for you to put you into the future. I suggest you go to Juan Martinez, who also plays the guitar, and you, you need to go on for that kind of training. She was a very selfless type of woman. She looked out for us first and for our development. that she brings forth is because of her passion for for the arts and for what it gives to people that picture was when when i was in rhythms of spain with fed federico ray and that was his costume too he was a costume designer since he was 13 years old and he was very famous he did a broadway show um I think it was Hello, Dolly. I think you must have seen it. for art really makes people connect to her. That's one of the things that she brings forth is because of her passion for, for the arts and for what it gives to people. I know that the only thing I know how to do well is dance. I want to pass it on. I want people to understand it better. And I know that the dancers in my company, more so than anybody else, the first dancers of Ballet Hispanico, believed in the mission and believed what they were doing. That's why we're still alive today. Tina Ramirez is a leading force in the dance world and a pioneer. I was teaching in Milwaukee at that time. Venezuela. She is the daughter of a Mexican bullfighter and the grandniece of a Puerto Rican educator. That combination of feisty agility and dedication to learning has proven to be a recipe for a lifetime of success. Tina grew up in New York that City. That was when I was dancing with the company. Spanish dance. And, and this was the first year we did the Parks Department tour, 1971, I think it was. A rich blend of dance. This is when I was El Chico. Her unique approach to contemporary. This is my original company dancing in Lower Manhattan. When I was a little girl. I wanted to be in the theater. This I is us that. doing school programs. And I've been very happy. Nice. Very nice. Very nice, ladies. Her professional career began with Federico Ray's company. 1940s. She toured internationally with the group, 
followed by two years dancing in Spain and studying with Luisa Pariset. Back in New York, she performed with her sister. That's at Chicago, Louis Armstrong, with Louis Armstrong. In 1963, Copper and Brass, Bob Fosse, invited her to take over her Spanish dance. That was with Lola Bravo, my teacher. Expanded class offerings, launched a professional dance training program, and arranged community performances. La Boda de Luis Alonso, choreography, Paco Fernandez. In 1970, she established Ballet Hispanico to develop and share her visionary fusion of ballet, modern, and Latin dance forms. Every year, Primeros Pasos reaches over 25 school programs all over the country. The children's reaction to the program is really fantastic. That's another that thing that I started. It was the costuming, everybody alike. We are a traditional for the school children. dance company, but at the same time, we're doing innovative work. And I think that we are stretching the art form of how people look at Hispanic dance. After 38 years, Ms. Ramirez is stepping down from her role as artistic director. She has built a brilliant and living mosaic that embraces dancers of all nationalities and has influenced countless young people to work towards their dreams. She has given Hispanic culture a place in American dance and established one of the nation's most important cultural institutions. Tina, why did you start your company? Okay, I'm trying to create a company so that we can have jobs. And not only that, so we can also show people that we have beauty. And uh, beauty of color, beauty of costume, beautiful music, and that we're all together. <laughs> Thank you. All right, you're welcome. Tina, I have a question for you. I asked it earlier, but let's go back because it's so beautiful to watch your company. Um, what is the relationship? It's a very uh, wonderful but complicated vocabulary that you're teaching. Um, um, it'd be hard. I mean, a dancer has a lot to do every day in Bella Hispanico. Um, could you talk about the relationship between Latin rhythms, flamenco, and escuela bolera? Well, you see, I. I am not the choreographer to some of the pieces that you saw. I, in fact, you didn't see any of my pieces in, in, in that, in that uh, because I had already given up in 76 or 